They put a lot of caffeine in my coffee today. It was on dark roast. It tasted kind of strange, but you know what? I'm high. Have you ever been high off coffee? I don't like it. <laughs> Perfect. What's the deal? 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 Yo, what's the deal? What's the deal? What's the deal? Hey, what's the deal? What's good, everybody? I'm Steve Discourse. What up, y'all? It's your girl, Jay Cali. Back again for another week of What's the Deal? This week, we got the State of the Union that happened. You know we got the updates. You know we couldn't let that slide. And we also got to do a recap on the fiasco that is government leadership in Virginia. Oh, my God. President Trump talking about being anti-late-term abortion. Shocker. And he doubled down in the State of the Union on his anti-immigration rhetoric. So uh, that's going to be the rundown, but we're going to start with that mess in Virginia. Oh, my God. And and we're going to, you know what we're going to do? We're going to draw it over to Liam Neeson. All right, y'all. So, first of all, update. I'm mad because last week I was so excited. I was like, yeah, Ralph Northam's going to resign. We're going to get a black governor of Virginia. It's Black History Month. All right, come on. Justin Fairfax is about to get it popping. First of all, Ralph Northam reneged, and now he's talking about he's not going to resign. Yeah, so apologies for that. We, we we didn't have the right information when we said that. We were excited. Um, so thanks for bearing with us. You're still here with us for this week. So thank you for that because we got even better information. That scandal has just continued to snowball. It's come out since um, that the lieutenant governor, Justin Fairfax, has been alleged twice of sexual assault. And the, the next, the third highest ranking member in uh, Virginia, the attorney general, has also been caught in a scandal of wearing blackface. It doesn't stop there, though. The fourth highest elected official in Virginia, Republican Senator Tommy Norman, back in, now this goes back a while, to 1968, he was the editor of the yearbook at the Virginia Military Institute, where there was all kind of racist descriptions oh of God. students and images of blackface. This thing was kind of a mess. Now, I know some people say, man, yeah, but it was 1968. But you know what? There was people in the 60s who were white marching against and organizing against being racist in such a blatant, casual, careless way. So that, for me, is not an out. I'm sorry. That's not an out to be like, yeah, but, you know, man, we were racist back then. We just were. <laughs> this doesn't make it all right. Uh, and so there have been a lot of calls for um, actually primarily just those top three Democrats to resign. Uh, I haven't heard so much about the Republican resigning, but this is a rare moment of yes. bipartisanship. Yes. The Republicans are like, yeah, you Democrats resign. And I can't Democrats are it. like, man, we've been saying you got to resign for stuff like this, so we're going to ride with our stance and say you got to resign, even though you're our people right now. So. I don't want to get into that too much. Uh, I want to pivot over because in a very different way, Liam Neeson is in the headlines for some racist controversy. Wait. So while all four of these people are embroiled in scandals for secrets that were kind of leaked and divulged and so, you know sprung on them, Liam Neeson brought this on himself. He was in an interview, and he recounted an incident um, 27 or 30-something years ago where uh, a close friend of his, a woman, was raped, and he was really upset by that, and she didn't know who it was, and for some reason, uh, he asked, what color were they? And she said it was a black man, and he admitted, he confessed, and it, that he, wanted to, he went out on the streets, and he had um, like a, a weapon, and he was hoping for someone to come out of the pubs drunk or something like that, say something wrong to him so that he could kill that person, a black person, not just any person right. coming out of the pub. And this was scandalous. Uh, I mean, it's shocking for a number of reasons. Scandalous because of the obvious um, just racial targeting of it. And um, to me, it's really raised a lot of questions about the idea of 
or the possibility of uh, redemption, of learning your lesson, of having a feeling like this and maybe being mistaken in it and, and knowing better and learning better or changing? Or does, does something like this define you now? So, and, and this, we can tie it into, should these people be forced to resign in Virginia over something that was happened long ago, or are they good now? Can they prove themselves better? Was it a temporary lapse? Was it something that was maybe part of their personality and they've learned since to, to change from that? Uh, because I'm not going to sit here and, and defend Liam Neeson. I don't know Liam Neeson. There's plenty of details that I don't know. None of us know. Maybe there's a detail out there that I didn't read in researching this that someone else did. So I'm not here to defend Liam Neeson, but the conversation I think is worth it um, because of the way that this came up. He brought this out on his own to say like, this was a, a bad time in my life. This was a grave error. It's something he's regretted. And is there, val is there value in that? Like is. First of all, no, no, it's no such thing as it's just a smudge on your character and history. You've learned from it. You grew out of it. And now you're a different person in this circumstance. I think that, Okay, when I was 10 years old, I used to get into fights in school, and now I no longer go around and fight because I'm not a child anymore and I don't beat people up. Okay, there's not a lot of harm in that other than the fact that you're a rowdy, rambunctious kid or whatever. There's things that you can learn and grow out of. But when your mistakes directly contribute to, and I'm going to use the term genocide because that's the way I feel, of like entire populations of people, you don't get to just outgrow it especially when and it's different it's different for the um, elected officials and for Liam Neeson for the elected officials your only growth came after you got caught you didn't apologize you didn't think to mention it it seems like even with Northam doubling down on being like oh I'm not resigning I'm just going to apologize and then that turns into well actually that wasn't even me in the photos it's like you don't feel bad you are not ashamed. You haven't grown from it. You're just trying to pr protect your job. So, first of all, you didn't grow from it. And I don't believe most people who try to say, oh, yeah, I mean, you know, that was the past. It was 1963, da, 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 da. If you're not actively doing things to undo what you've done, you can't just say so, I'm different now. What are you doing to show that you've changed? What are you doing to help and benefit these people who you've hurt for so many years of your life? Uh, so that's the question. So has he done for so many years of his life hurt people or was it a was lapse it in judgment at the moment no. that we found out in his yearbook Steve. i mean we don't but we don't know we i don't know i don't think that people's lapse in judgment i don't again yeah i don't know this is my opinion these are not facts but you think that the one lapse in judgment that he had was on the extreme end of the spectrum as dressing up in a kkk costume I'm like i've been such a nice guy and i am not a racist but why my one racist moment I was a KKK well, member. Blackface. We don't know which one he was because he's a liar. Well, he said he wasn't in that, but he admitted to wearing blackface on another occasion. So, so he definitely wore now, blackface and maybe dressed up as a KKK, and we're thinking it may have just been one lapse of judgment. No, this man perpetuated racist tropes and probably was just racist. That's what I'm assuming. That's what I would assume about a person who wears blackface and KKK mm -hmm. robes. I assume that you're a racist. I think that I'm warranted in that. Okay, so skepticism for Ralph Northam. What about in a situation like Liam Neeson where, yeah, this was clearly, like, horrific. I mean, on, on one hand, I'm kind of scared to say this because it could take it totally dragged, but on one hand, it's understandable. Your friend was raped and you want some kind of vengeance. I get that. Is it unfortunate circumstance that her friend says she was raped by a black man and now that's the target of your aggression i don't necessarily want to get into that uh because because again it's complicated and this is about details that are so fuzzy and, and none of us really know but he he brought this out on his own because he he felt he was coming from a an honest place of growth is it possible not for liam neeson specifically right i don't want you to uh, defend or or class blame on him necessarily but i'm just curious where or should we just be wholesale throwing everyone out who 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 has any type of blemished record until hmm. we get the people in who don't have any blemishes like that or until 
those people who have had their lives ruined are raising kids who now are raised to have unblemished. It's so hard to say and because I'm emotionally invested, so I don't have an objective opinion. You get what I'm saying? Because I'm it's right. it's hard not to just be angry at the lapse of judgment, not only that he experienced back then in, you know, walking around hoping to just be able to kill a random black person because he was mad at an unknown black guy, so he was blaming the entire race. I don't have to say why that's problematic. Absolutely. But also in his lapse of judgment in saying that today in 2019, I feel like he very well could have kept that to himself. And there's two reasons why. Wait. And it's not right. about if I think he's grown from it or not. I'm going to get to that in one second. Okay. But just like, why did you feel the need to bring that up and to talk about it? You can say it's because you've grown or it could actually be because you need to hook us and so watching the movie that you're promoting, again, it's not coming from a genuine place of growth. You're trying to benefit. You're telling me this story because you want me to give you money and watch this movie about a man who's vengeful and looking to hurt someone. You mm. don't actually care about the fact that for a period of you, your life, you walked around actively searching for a black man to kill. You want me to give you money. You want me to feel bad and empathize with what you went through. Don't talk to me about growth when you're going to benefit directly from the reason why you're talking about it. You have not grown. Hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've caught me. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. I mean, that's that's valid. Um for me, I have to ask these questions for sure because yeah. like in the same way that you're saying it's hard to have uh, objective response to this because it's it's emotional for me on the other side i'm more likely to see myself possibly be in his position right. one day so for me it's natural almost to look at this and say okay just in general if we generalize this out of liam neeson how does redemption happen and so you, you mentioned yeah uh, demonstrating actions and a commitment to undoing or yes. combating that yes absolutely but i guess the trick is understanding that while this might have been a momentary mistake for him where he was wrapped up in emotion and just angry and that was the target unfortunately or whether it was um was it the attorney general we talked about in in, in florida a couple of weeks ago who wore the katrina yeah. survivor blackface yeah. costume the important thing is to remember, which is what we said in the past, that the potential is all, was always in the back of your head then. You know, for this guy right. in Florida, the potential was there that that was even an option. And I think that probably does take long-term work to look at yourself and, and, and really work on that as a process. And, yeah, some, some very overt actions to, to counter that are probably warranted but it's interesting because so many times in our political conversations we we are kind of to the point where we're fed up and if you've crossed a line we're done with you completely mm -hmm. you know like we sort of mentioned about kamala harris's run for president you know she has this history as attorney general and boom okay maybe we're done with her some people are right some people aren't and on one hand i totally understand that and on the other hand part of me wonders do we need to understand that there's a totality of a person, even though there's these parts that are maybe a hundred percent problematic? And I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I feel one way or the other completely, but what about this? All right, before we move on, cause this has been a good conversation, but we went out for a while. What if we just had to get rid of these people hundred percent? Mm. So that anybody with totally with a, with a blemish like this, whether we think it's long and long term and, deep rooted or just a momentary lapse in judgment. What if we just got rid of everything and suddenly all these positions of power uh, in corporations or in government were all vacated? Like, would that be a solution? Because they're coming out one at a time and um, we're forcing people out. No. What if we could snap our fingers like Thanos and say, okay, boom, you're all out. Let's fill these positions now going forward. Like, is that because one at a time, it's easier to justify every individual time we do it. 
But what if that was the case? What if we could just snap our fingers no. and get every potentially problematic person out? Well, first of all, everything exists in polarity. You have to have the opposite force in order for the thing to matter. Like, whatever I'm doing has to be purposeful. I can't just be out here screaming to the abyss. What am I fixing? If I had all these elected officials who were not problematic in, problematic in any way, what are they working towards then? If I snap my finger and got rid of all the problems, then I don't even need them, essentially. But that's one. But two, I don't think that solutions are necessarily reactive. Solutions are proactive. So you have to um, like do the work, like I said earlier, to undo the systems you can't just pluck the people out who perpetuate the tropes. Right. Like, the system still exists. Mm -hmm. So I can pull Liam Neeson. We can pull Ralph Northam. We can pluck Donald Trump. We can pluck all the issues. Right. But as long as the system is in place and no one's done the work to undo it, we actually haven't even so, scratched the surface of fixing the problem. Well, yeah, so speaking of the systems, though, but what if we could snap our fingers and just all the Ralph Northams are gone right now? Like, they're all exposed, and we push them all out of office right now like would that be a good thing would would there be progress to come right after that if the entire would that be like a clean slate it could be a clean slate i, I, I don't know it's, it's such a grand gesture i really can't even wrap my mind around it, it, it because is big, everybody so yeah. has a, everybody that's currently running our nation in my opinion has some sort of major problem it's problematic. It we would be. have to get. It, we would it, have to over again. It just goes back to we would have to overhaul the entire United States of America. We would be started from scratch. It kind of would. And and for for listeners, yeah, I didn't tell Jay Kelly I would ask that particular thing, <laughs> this kind of concept ahead of time. So this is kind of dropped. And, and it's yeah, it's a big like yeah kind of wow thing. But yeah, no, I agree. Like if we were going to take anybody who's had even a momentary lapse in, in judgment like that, we'd probably have the majority of any seat of power in, in schools or government or business, we'd probably have so many vacancies there wouldn't be enough people left to uh -uh. fill them all. But, okay, I appreciate this. I, it's just a, yeah, I don't know. I've been thinking about it a lot since Liam Neeson volunteered it about the idea of how do you, I mean, I think it was a brave thing. Maybe it was maybe it was a, not a smart move, but I think it was a brave and to, to, the, to some extent, in, no, a, in a way no, I respect it. I think it, it unless you're unless like you said it's it it was in concert. They were with ulterior the movie, motives. Then okay, then it would have been a brave thing if he would have just been like, "Hey guys, you know what? I just I just have to say this because I've grown so much and I've worked so hard on calling out racism and on undoing systems of oppression, and I have to admit my own blemishes." That would be very very different. But a Liam Neeson, to my knowledge, doesn't do anything to undo systems of oppression, so it seems very ingenuous from yeah. the jump, and also his purpose for saying it just wasn't authentic mm. or genuine so you know what All liam right. you're just an idiot you called yourself out and we're still not gonna go see your movie <sighs> okay that was a big one i didn't even really anticipate it being that that big but we got into it yeah i appreciate you coming delving de into that rabbit hole with me somewhat unprepared we didn't have a long planning session about that conversation like we do on, on a lot of the <laughs> issues we cover so uh, what's next on our list? Okay, State of the Union happened, so let's get back to that because that was a big story of the week. Oh my God, Donald! So Trump. We got a, f a list of a few uh, of a few highlights that we're just gonna kind of jump through real quick. The thing I wrote on the list: he he wants to cure HIV and AIDS in the next fifteen years or so, um, and that's cool. Can't right. be mad at that. Who could it be? seemed a little out of left field. Like I don't. <laughs> I was like, where did I'm that sorry, come that from? That was random for me. Yeah, like it's not not <laughs> bad, but I'm also like, huh? What are you talking and about? The only man? thing I'll say to that is, a curing initiatives like this require one thing: massive amounts of money, public funding, government funding, government agencies, government funded research. But the Trump administration, and in many ways the the Republican Party, is about small government. So this is great that you want to cure it, but. Trump has been sending his transition teams and his advisors into all these branches of the government, essentially seeming like to dismantle the functions that they serve. And so that's my only question is, okay, you want this massive public health initiative, but at the same time, every time we turn around, you're dismantling the EPA, you're dismantling the Department of Energy. Uh, and and it, so I don't really see how he's going to accomplish that, but whatever. So we'll see. So what else was on there? 
Donald Trump is talking about how there's currently more women working in the workforce than ever before. Finally pulling your weight. I'm just oh. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that was so rude. I'm sorry. Steve. That's out of he's now added to my list of problematic fuckboys. Wow. Steve. Whoa. All right. We got to put the explicit label on this episode. <laughs> that was an out of character joke. I was just kidding. It was out of character. My feelings are hurt. I don't <laughs> I even feel bad for cussing at you. I, wow. Good. When you but think you cool, know though. a guy. It's cool, but you know what? Trump, what have you actively done to bring more women into the workforce? I feel like there's more women in the workforce because women have been breathing down the neck of America for the past four years. Women have been having the Women's March. We've been putting our fists in the air. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm sorry, I just accidentally credited the Women's March for something. Wow. But yeah, like women have been out here working, pushing, promoting our own agenda. So for him to address it in the State of the Union as if it's like, oh, my God, thanks to the work of the presidency and the White House, we've put more women. You didn't do uh-huh. that for us. Well, but he didn't technically say he's put more women. He so, didn't, but he's— So I'll like give him that the, right, it, it, okay. as, a, as a just, as a objective statement. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt this one time only in my life. There's I won't. an objective statement. I won't because I, mean, I feel like it's an implication there. Well, sure, but that's what politicians do anyway. True. They take credit for stuff that has nothing to do with them. True. But also he mentioned that there's more women in Congress than ever before. Also ironic because the Republicans had actually a dip in re- women representing. Mm-hmm. So the it was all made up and then some by women being elected on the Democratic side. So all right. Well, I guess. Shout out to that political party it does some good things from time to time and uh let's see he also said oh this got a huge response everybody loved it when he said america will not be a socialist country people went wild people were swinging from the rafters cheering (laughs) high-fiving they were crying uh oh man we were born free and we will stay free and this got a huge response and it was um, hard to say exactly one reason why he said this, but in general, I mean, you have a woman like uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez who is very vocal about her Democratic Socialist mm-hmm. ties. Right. Bernie Sanders, similarly. Right. So there is a wave of people coming from this perspective into the policy conversations. And all I want to say is for people who don't exactly get what that means – there's a lot of scary language out there and opponents will act like if you're coming from a socialist perspective in American politics, like you want some dictatorship and you want to live in like some crumbling authoritarian country where nothing is good and there's lines for bread for four hours every day and that's all you can afford is bread. Like, come on, man. Like as much as I don't like a lot of Republican and right-wing stances, I don't think their goal is to destroy the country. And I think it's disingenuous on their side as well to say the same thing, that someone on the other side, the goal is like to destroy it. Like, right. who who would want that? Nobody in those countries, not nobody, but there's ways that you justify that you think that situation is there, but nobody wants to live in a hellhole and, and have no freedoms and no this and that. So... A lot of these socialist uh, conversations are coming up are just around what? Health care. Right. They, most Americans want health care. And the way we do that is through policies that some people are calling socialist. Can I say a joke that I heard that I can't get out of my head about this? Go for it. I saw a meme that said, like, Donald Trump thinks that food stamps are the problem when I know four crack is that'll steal the entire meat department. <laughs> And I was like, no, right. Like, you can take away food stamps and stuff. That's not going to stop the fact that people who are actually really, really poor just go and steal all the food in the grocery store. I mean, people are going to have to. Well, people are going to have to get by however they're going to have to get by. And to me, I think it just makes sense that we can all be in this together. Literally, yeah. We can all be in this together. Let's do it. Also, like, it's. I don't see the big deal with socialism. Like, I get it. Like, if it goes to a certain point where it can become debilitating, I guess. I've never seen that. But what is the big issue and why are people so against it? I need somebody to break that down for Well, I, I think because there are some countries that have gone in a negative way, like I said, towards authoritarian regimes and, and repressive kind of cultures under a socialist government. And so I get that that's in people's mind, but... I mean, 
to think that that is what people want, to think that's the outcome, doesn't make sense. I mean, there's a million pathways. I mean, there's infinite way, pathways forward from today, right? So to say, oh, they must want to live like Cuba or live right. like Russia or live like some place where we think the quality of life is just horrible. Nobody, no one wants that. I think my bigger question so it's is, just a little misleading. like, A, do we actually think that anybody wants it? But also, B, America isn't even on that type of trajectory. Like, it would take, like, so many years worth of extreme socialism for America to ever even reach that point. So I don't right. even, like, so, let's be realistic. Um, but actually, good news for people who, who might be more curious about this. Uh, I do want to talk about the Green New Deal in a future episode, which okay. is uh, a sweeping uh, proposal um, submitted by Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez mm -hmm. primarily. So we'll get into that in a future episode because I think it's really interesting. I've been wanting to talk about it anyway. Before it was a theoretical idea that we all kind of, a lot of people understood. Yeah. But now it's more explicitly drawn out. While we're on this break, we want to remind you, do not forget to share the podcast. Share it to all of your social media platforms, your Facebook, your Instagram, Twitter. Don't forget to use the hashtag What's the Deal Pod whenever you share anything. And like and subscribe the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, wherever you listen. Thanks for spreading the love. You know we appreciate you. What else did Trump say that seemed to be Yeah, shocking? you know, my man was talking about late-term abortion and how he's against it. We all knew he was against late-term abortion, but then he said that lawmakers are cheering with delight upon the passage of legislation that would allow a baby to be ripped from their mother's womb mere moments before birth. And it was like, that doesn't happen. Even in late-term abortion, no baby is being ripped from their mother's womb. Definitely not moments before birth like why would you say that I mean, in the it, state of the it union it sounds like some fictional super villain like plot like <laughs> yeah. there's a delivery room and the villain like swipes in and ah, ha, ha, i'm gonna kill your baby right before <laughs> we put it in your arms i don't um, i'm just so confused so no go ahead yeah so there's plenty of people out there i think who maybe abortion is an uncomfortable topic for them either they disagree with it right. or they're on the fence and they want to be very careful about how it goes forward and so there is an understanding from some people that that this scenario Trump put out is not exactly far from the truth. But I think it's much more measured than that. This isn't far from the truth. Babies being ripped no, there's, from wounds there's, there's moments people before with birth. Concerns about oh, abortion. Oh, I was about who, to say. Who, wherever they get the information or lack of information or whatever it is think that this maybe isn't too far from right. what is being proposed. But Steve, and that's so, the problem. Right. So in specific uh, New York recently um, put a law into place allowing abortions up to 24 weeks. Yep. So there are some places trying to restrict it to like five or six or, you know, very, very few weeks. It's got to happen and be done right away. So 24, <laughs> if, if you're against abortion, 24 might be pushing it now because um, it's very liberal. But it also allows it abortions after that if the doctor has like sound medical basis and reasoning that – Either the, the fetus won't be viable or that this is going to be a risk to the mother. I'll tell you this. In the past few weeks since this conversation about late-term abortion has, like, really been buzzing, I've been – I'm a little nervous to even share my stance on abortion publicly. But, like, I've been a little torn about if it's right or wrong because – Late-term abortion to me is very, very scary. It's a scary thought, and I can't say I am for or against it. I don't know because I've been reading a lot of stories from mothers who have been saying, you know, I was adamantly against late-term abortion. I wanted to keep my baby personally. I don't think anyone should be aborting a fetus at 24 weeks or whatever the case. Who are like, But then I found out that the baby in my womb was terminally ill, was in an extreme amount of pain. I didn't even know this until I was 22 weeks pregnant. I had, I had hours to make the decision on if I was going to terminate the pregnancy or not. And because I was so far along and because I wanted to give my baby a chance, I decided not to have the abortion. And then, you know, it was a tumultuous pregnancy. When the baby was born, they suffered for the first 24 hours of their life. 
and ultimately just died of their own injuries. Like one baby was born with, like she couldn't even breathe. Her lungs were severely underdeveloped and she knew this when the baby was in the womb but decided to give her a chance and she suffocated to death hours after being born. Or one baby who had a condition where her, one of her bones broke like every couple minutes and she just laid there, every bone in her body broken in multiple places. And again, mom knew this when she was pregnant but decided to give the baby a chance. So now this baby suffered and died. So I'm like, that's really scary and it makes you want to say, well, people with these types of conditions should have the opportunity to say, now that I have this new information I don't want this baby to just suffer for hours and then die anyway. Yeah, I don't know. I'm So it's tricky and I get it. Um, and personally, like I don't, uh, if it were up to me, I would like to avoid the need for an abortion in any given circumstance. I actually have a son Mm -hmm. that, uh, a girlfriend I was dating in high school, she got pregnant and we said, you know, we don't want to do an abortion. So we gave him up for adoption to a family Mm -hmm. because abortion just didn't seem like a, a thing that we wanted to do. Right. At the same time. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's my business to tell you what to do. And and right. what it comes down to is, A, it's constitutionally legal to have abortion. Roe v. Wade supported that. Mm-hmm. Um, but the debate comes down to people who view it as a moral issue and people who view it as a medical as issue. A medical issue. Mm-hmm. And that's the problem. We're never going to be able to come to an agreement because those are two different discussions. Yes. So m- for me, you might... I mean, my feelings about it sort of come down on a moral thing. I mean, I'm not going to judge you if that's what you've decided. Uh, really not. It's your choice. But I'd prefer if we just didn't have to do that, right? Pre- pregnancies happen. And if you guys were just having sex and somebody got pregnant, then, I, you know, I don't know. Maybe you got to ride with it. And I don't know. But I'm not going to tell you what to do. It's not my business. Right? It's scary because I think people assume that the late-term abortion is for people who just last minute decide, oop, I don't want this baby anymore. And, and Right, and that's a good point. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine that there are women carrying a baby all this time, and then at the end they're like, yeah, you know what? I'm actually good. I think I'm going to bail on this. <laughs> there I, definitely are, that, but it's just extremely rare. Well, and that's what I would think, right? Yeah. So, so to, then to me the thing is, okay, well, is it medical? I mean, obviously it is because we're dealing with someone's physical body and their health, which this can be a risk to them. It has all sorts of outcomes and effects after you have the baby and before while you're carrying, right? There's there's a lot of health implications. So to me, most of these laws are based on medicine, right? And so that's what the New York thing says. It says if there is, quote, the patient is within 24 weeks of the commencement of pregnancy, or there is an absence of fetal viability or the abortion is necessary to protect the patient's life or health. And that seems reasonable to me. It's not about people just being like, man, I'm right. pregnant. I don't need this damn kid. Right. Get out of here. And, and but, it, but again, to me, it's like, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. That's up to you. Uh, it's not really my business. And leave it up to the judgment of the doctor at that point. It's a medical issue. It's not for me, someone who knows nothing about medicine or pregnancy, to decide, is this a reasonable, is this a medical emergency? I don't know. If the doctor says it is, then it is. He's been in school for 55 years to be able to make that type of judgment call. Let him make it. And let's all just, like, move on. We don't, you know what I'm saying? Move on from it. It's his call or her call. Ooh, it's her call. I like that better. But, yeah. I mean, that's perfect segue. Should we move on to the last topic for the day? Let's do it. So Trump in the State of the Union doubled down on his immigration rhetoric. There was um, actually just the other day, there were 200 illegal immigrants in North Carolina uh, rounded up in a raid. And they said, look, this is the new norm. So this is in keeping with Donald Trump's efforts to really ramp up enforcement to identify illegal immigrants. immigrants and get them out of here and he didn't back down on the wall there's still no ability to negotiate or to step down from from his insistence on a wall and that's not exactly anything new right but immigration got splashes in the headlines this week as well Mm -hmm. for another reason well your favorite favorite rapper not really Um, 21 Savage recently got arrested and is now being threatened with deportation. I know y'all think it's funny. You're going to deport him to Atlanta? Yes, that's exactly where. 
No, apparently, y'all, 21 Savage is British. And I know that we already knew this because this has been news all week. And people have been kind of laughing about it, making hilarious memes about it. But the truth is, there's really nothing funny about someone being torn away from their family, threatened with deportation, sent back to a country that they haven't known and Lord knows how long, and, you know, for who knows what reason. I mean, realistically, are we really thinking that ICE is popping up and just like, oh, my God, 21 Savage is British. Let's get rid of him now. Why? Why, after 21 years of 21 Savage, are we suddenly trying to send him back to London? Or why, after 21 years of any father being in this country, are we just deciding to pop up and turn their lives upside down? And, you know, it really made me start to think this week about this is people's reality. Like, I am not an immigrant, and many of us aren't. And it's hard for us to imagine that every day of our life we're wondering if ICE is just going to pop up on our doorstep and say, hey, your time is up. You got to go. And now instead of checking my bank statement or instead of checking up on how many more hours of leave I have from work, I got to check up on my deportation status and see how much more time I have left in this country. Yeah, and I think I appreciate when you brought that point up in our, you know, planning meeting, because I think that's what's missing in a lot of the conversation is people don't pause to really put themselves in other shoes. And like, I have friends I grew up with in, in elementary and middle school, and we had classmates who were there illegally. Hmm. And I didn't necessarily know it at the time, but since then we know. And some of my classmates have these anti-immigrant views But then in the conversation when you say, well, what about so-and-so? And And what about other so-and-so childhood friends we grew up with? Like, you know them. Are they any different from from us, right? What's the difference? Like, Because we get caught up in the rhetoric, and this is why the president of the United States saying things like they're sending rapists and murderers, and it sounds like, oh, it's just talking, relax. It's important because people literally internalize that kind of language and they forget that they might know somebody in that situation or they might just think that these people literally are different human beings a different type of human being than the rest of human existence that just wants to go about their lives and get that work get their paycheck take care of their family buy a new tv whatever you want to do right. and that's the trick and, and like you said people are really spending every day of their life doing the same thing you and i are doing but they've got this whole like existential threat. Yes. Looming over them. It's so scary. Like I could not imagine just being like I mean, and the problems that come along with it, like, okay, when they send me back, what am I gonna do? Where am I gonna live? My whole family is here in the United States. All of my friends are here in the United States. I need to go back to this foreign land. I was a child like for like for people like twenty one or for people, you know, like everyday immigrants. I've been here since I was a child. I don't know anything about this other country. I don't even speak the language, some of them. Like, yeah. what? And, and I mean, in some cases, you're an adult, and you came here as an adult, and now you're back as an adult, and that's fine. You know, there's a lot of different yeah. scenarios of that course. plays out, but... I, I don't mean, know. P- I just feel like the process is a little tumultuous and scary and abrupt, and there has to be a way to... Oh my! Like get people transitioned. I don't. I'm not. I don't want to be an apologist. Like they're here illegally. I understand that. I understand what the issues are too. But just as like a person who is empathetic or empathic, mm-hmm. I get it. Yeah. I mean, look. But to me, yeah, they're here illegally, which is what essentially they didn't go through the proper paperwork and yeah. applications. But uh, a lot of us are out here watching somebody else's Netflix account. All right. <laughs> Steve, stop. I it. mean, but look, we bend the rules all the time. For, for things that are not a big deal, right? Uh, I mean, how, mo- how, no- how many of us were illegally downloading music on Napster and LimeWire and all that stuff, on Torrents, right, on Pirate Bay and all that stuff? So we do it all the time over nothing. People are coming from thousands of miles away, from another world. They're risking li- their life just to get here, just to have a job and take care of their family and stuff, right? And we're treating them like they're not human for what? Not filling out the paperwork. Right. Essentially. And th- we have a backlog of people who want to come here legally. It's years and years. So why we could be expanding opportunities for people to come in legally. Yeah. And then I think now people opposed to that uh, get into probably a little bit of the xenophobia where it's like, well, how many can we allow? How many people can we allow, right, before it starts turning into, like, 
United States of Latin America type thing, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I guess to an extent that's fair because what if we just have millions of people a year coming in, millions and millions? I don't think it's a bad thing, but I get it if that makes you a little apprehensive. But we can't be criminalizing these people. We can't be treating them like they're not humans. Separating the children, of which it was came out that there's even thousands more children separated from their families than w- they originally admitted. Mm-hmm. And they've admitted that those thousands more, they just don't know where they are. They, they just can't reunite them. They, they've lost complete track. Yes. Which goes back to my point about the AIDS that he wants to cure, but he doesn't want to put the funding into the government research and pro- programs. They wanted to have all this illegal Im- or this immigration enforcement, but they weren't willing to do the work the administrative work of actually having a system in place. You're going to separate families. you got to be able to co- put them back together. That's just common decency. But they didn't want to do the homework of saying, okay, what do we actually need to do to implement this? So they just started tearing children apart, and they have no way to fix it. Maybe because they thought they would never be taken to account. Or maybe because they just didn't think that far ahead. Right. I, I don't know. It's At this point, we're really reaching into assumptions but um this could be a two-hour show God, it, it feels like it has been we've gotten into so much so i think that's plenty for this week agreed i'm tired a little tired out yeah um so thanks for rocking with us um next week we actually know a couple things we're going to talk about attorney uh, acting attorney general matthew whitaker testified in front of uh uh, a committee mm-hmm, yesterday mm-hmm. we didn't have time to talk about that so we'll touch base on that to the extent that we need to next week and the senate will actually be voting to confirm william barr as the new attorney general for the united states of america so that might be something big to talk about as Definitely, well yeah uh, it's looking like he'll get the confirmation but you know we gotta wait to see if it really goes down i can actually predict the and future, so. as i mentioned earlier i've been wanting to talk about the green new deal so we'll also jump into that a little bit or a lot You'll have to tune in to find out how deep we go. So with that said, I'm Steve Discourse. I'm Jay Callie. That's That's the the deal. deal. All right, people. Thanks so much for tuning in another week. What's the deal podcast? You can follow us on social media at Steve Discourse. And you can catch Jay Callie. It's Jay Callie. I-T-S-J-A-Y-C-A-L-L-I. We got to send a big shout out to Clifford Cartel for composing our theme music. And wherever you listen to this, make sure you subscribe. Family, subscribe. Write us a review. Share, share, share the podcast. Subscribe to it wherever you listen. Share it with your friends, family, your loved ones. Heck, share it with your enemies. We don't care. Just help us spread that word. We truly appreciate it.